Did you know that two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? I know it for me. It's more like 25. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. Look, it's too late for me. My hair is not coming back. You don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved drugs for treating hair loss, so you may have tried them before but never at a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, well, is it gonna be some sort of medicine so it's gonna be expensive? Well, you couldn't be more wrong. Keep starts at just $10 a month. So how does it work? Well, for one thing, no need to visit the doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult, and a bit later, a discreet package arrives at your door, and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. So, if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, it's not going to fix itself. Do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash top tens, or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. And now today's video. Finding out with absolute certainty what happened hundreds or even thousands of years ago is an almost impossible task. Scholars try their best, but they are limited from the outset by the historical evidence that they have at their disposal. Today we look at 10 well-known figures from the past whose place in the historical record is uncertain enough that some people have doubted their very existence. Number 10. Lycurgus of Sparta even by ancient history standards, the existence of Lycurgus is poorly attested, even though he was arguably the most important Spartan in history and the one mainly responsible for transforming the city-state into the most feared and powerful nation of the Greek world. This is because the Spartans simply weren't interested in keeping written records. We found out about Lycurgus from external sources, mainly Greek philosophers and historians such as Herodotus, Xenophon, and Plato. But by that point, hundreds of years had already passed, so whatever historical fact may have existed got mixed in with the legend and myth. If Lycurgus did exist, he would have lived around 800 BC. After traveling around the Greek world, Lycurgus decided that it was time for a change in Sparta. So he returned home and erected the set of laws known as the Great Retra, which transformed Sparta into the fierce military society that gained everlasting notoriety. Number 9. Jenny Geddes the story of Jenny Geddes is a perfect example of the butterfly effect, a seemingly insignificant incident that ultimately leads to a much greater and momentous event. In this case, we start with an angry woman throwing a chair and it ends with the execution of Charles I, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The story begins in 1637 at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. Tensions were already pretty high between England and the Scots, and they were exacerbated by the fact that King Charles I seemed determined to for Scotland to abide by the religious rights of the Church of England, whether it wanted to or not. On the day in question, the Dean of Edinburgh began reading for the first time from the newly printed Scottish version of the Book of Common Prayer to the dismay of his congregation. One woman named Jenny Geddes decided that she wasn't going to sit there and take it. Devil cause you colic false thief, dare you say the mass in my ear, she shouted as she got up and threw her folding stool at his head. A full-scale riot ensued, which spread to all of Edinburgh and then all of Scotland. That act is now considered a catalyst for the War of the Three Kingdoms, which ended with Charles's execution. All of this was well and good, but historical evidence for the existence of Jenny Geddes has proved hard to come by. Many say she was never real, or maybe it was just a random name given to the unknown woman who actually threw the chair. Some have even speculated that Jenny and her friends may have actually been apprentices dressed in women's clothing who attended church specifically to cause a riot. Number 8. The London Monster Hundreds of years before the infamous Jack the Ripper, London was terrorized by a crime spree of another maniac, one who liked to follow women around at night, cut up their dresses, and prick them in the buttocks using a knife or a needle. He became known as the London Monster and may have been responsible for over 50 attacks over a two-year period. At the same time, though, he may never have existed, and it's all simply just a product of mass hysteria. But what exactly caused it in the first place? While a few attacks on women certainly happened, there was nothing to suggest they were caused by the same man. The newspapers certainly sowed the seeds of panic, as did criminals who often use cries of monster to create a frenzied mob and escape the ensuing confusion. Then there were also women who claimed to be victims of the monster for attention. The drama came to a head in 1791. A 23-year-old Welshman named Rinwick Williams was charged with the crimes, but his trial was a complete farce. Some of the women called to testify admitted to making the whole thing up, while others positively claimed that Williams was not the man 
who had attacked them. Ultimately, he was still convicted of three charges and was sentenced to six years in prison, and this seemed to help the whole hysteria die down, and the London monster was never heard from again. Number seven, William Tell. There is no denying that William Tell is an important folk hero and a pivotal figure in the history of Switzerland as a man who stood up to foreign tyranny, but the question remains, was he actually real? His story takes us back to 1307, to the town of Altdorf, at a time when Switzerland was under the dominion of the Austrian House of Habsburg. As a sign of his authority, the tyrannical local bailiff Albrecht Gessler placed his hat atop a pole in the market square and demanded that all who passed bow before it. One day, a peasant named William Tell walked by the hat with his son and refused to bow. As punishment, Gessler demanded that Tell shoot an apple off of his son's head in one try from 120 paces or face execution. William Tell succeeded, so his life was spared, even though he was still sent to prison. On the way there, he escaped and eventually assassinated Gessler, starting a rebellion that led to the liberation of Switzerland. It was a crucial moment, but scholars remain unable to trace the actions to a historical figure named William Tell. His story wasn't even written about until hundreds of years later, and controversially, the shooting of the apple scene seems to have been based on an older Danish Tell involving a Viking named Toko and King Harold Bluetooth. Number six, Yang Kyong Jong. At first, the story of Yang Kyong Jong seems perfect as one of those random facts you can whip out during a conversation. He was the only soldier to have fought on three sides during World War II. As a native Korean, Yang was first conscripted into the Imperial Japanese Army at the start of the war since Korea was part of the Empire of Japan back then. During battle, he was captured by the Soviets and sent to a gulag, but later was pressed into the Red Army to fight Nazi Germany on Europe's Eastern Front. There, he was once again captured and became a peer of the Wehrmacht and sent to occupied France, where he was forced to defend Normandy during D-Day. There he was taken prisoner one last time by US paratroopers, which is when the famous photograph of him was taken, purportedly showing Yang wearing a German Wehrmacht uniform. His story was often shared without too much scrutiny, at least until 2005 when a South Korean company wanted to film a documentary about Yang Kyung Jong. They quickly discovered that there were no records that attest to him fighting for Japan, the USSR, and Nazi Germany. Furthermore, they also found that nobody really knew for sure who the Asian man in the famous photograph was, as the Americans could not communicate with him, and they labeled the picture simply as Japanese man. Number 5. Agnes McVie Gather round the fire, everybody, to hear the tale of Agnes McVie, a ruthless and bloodthirsty Scottish woman who operated a murder hotel along Canada's Caribou Wagon Road during the Caribou Gold Rush of the late 19th century. It is said that Angus, alongside her husband Jim McVie and her son-in-law Al Riley, kidnapped young women and sold them as sex slaves and also killed miners who stayed at the hotel, the 108-mile house, in order to steal their gold. Allegedly, Angus Agnes and her accomplices were responsible for over 50 killings and were only discovered after one of the girls they kidnapped managed to escape and tell the authorities about the gruesome goings on at the 108 Mile House. It said that Agnes buried all of the gold she took of her victims, and every now and then people still find some of these lost treasures as a reminder of the trail of blood left by Agnes McVie. It sure makes for a good story, but it seems like the legend of Agnes McVie may have originated during the 1970s in a book about buried treasure in British Columbia. You would think that a killing spree that left over 50 people dead might be newsworthy, but historians couldn't find mentions of it in newspapers of the day. Number four, Menes. Including Egyptian pharaohs almost feels like cheating a little bit because there are many of them who are only known as names inscribed on a wall. But we aren't going to go with just any pharaoh here. Menes, if he existed, would have been the first pharaoh, the one who united Upper and Lower Egypt into a single empire. The reason we're uncertain of his existence is that we have two different men who both claim to have unified Egypt. One of them is Menes, and the other one is Nama. We have more evidence to suggest that Nama was legit, including the Nama Pan a contemporary tablet that not only depicts the unification but also shows Nama wearing both the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, an important symbol that signified the pharaoh's authority over the two lands. So. <laughs> Where does that leave us with Menes? It's possible that he was a mythical figure, or maybe a different pharaoh who came after Nama, but there is also a strong belief among Egyptologists that he and Nama might have been one and the same person. Unless we find more evidence, this remains just speculation. 
Number three, John Henry. The legend of John Henry is one story that most American kids will hear at least once in their lives. During the mid to late 19th century, John Henry was a big, strong black man who worked on the railroads as a steel driver. His job involved swinging a giant sledgehammer to drill holes into the rock to make room for dynamite. It was arduous, backbreaking labor, one that John Henry did not want to give up. Therefore, when the railroad company brought in a steam power drill to speed up the process, Henry insisted that he was still the better option. And so a challenge was set. John Henry versus the drill, man versus machine. Henry picked up two large hammers and started pounding away at the rock, drilling a 14-foot hole, whereas the machine only managed to penetrate nine feet. John Henry had won the contest, and then he collapsed of exhaustion and died with the hammer in his hand. Since then, the tale of John Henry has been passed around numerous times in the forms of stories and ballads and novels. But whether or not there was ever a real John Henry remains a mystery. For most of his existence, he had been regarded simply as a folk hero. But some historians in recent decades believe they have found the real John Henry, a former Union soldier who was imprisoned for theft in Richmond, Virginia, and then sent to work on the railroad. Number two, William Shakespeare. We arrive now at a conspiracy that has been going strong for 150 years. Is it possible that the greatest writer in the English language was himself a work of fiction? Most people would say, no, of course not, don't be silly, but there are many others, including actors, authors, and scholars, who believe that somebody else wrote all of the plays that we credit to William Shakespeare. So who was the true author then? Dozens of candidates have been put forward, but the most popular choices include Sir Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, himself a successful playwright, and Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. But even within this conspiracy cabal, there aren't many disagreements. Some believe that Shakespeare got his hands on the plays using subterfuge, or even with the real writer's permission. At the very least, they don't deny the existence of William Shakespeare the man. But others are convinced that Shakespeare was simply the pseudonym of the true author who did not want to be associated with writing for various reasons, and that the guy we've seen in paintings was just someone hired to act as a front. Something it's possible that the writer may have been a woman, or maybe not even a single person, but rather a group of authors. Number one, King Arthur. We end with one of the most famous kings of all time, one whose story has been the subject of countless books, movies, works of art, and even musicals. King Arthur of Camelot. According to medieval histories, Arthur was a king who reigned during the late 5th to early 6th centuries and defended his people against the Saxon invaders. But the only surviving contemporary account of these battles, written by a monk named Gildas, makes no mention of the king. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that Arthur was named in the writings of a Welsh historian named Nennius. During the early 12th century, Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote his famed chronicle Historia Regnum Britannae, where he presented the lives of all the kings of Britain, starting with the legendary Brutus of Troy. Geoffrey was the first to present many of the elements associated with Arthur, such as the Excalibur sword, Lancelot the Loyal Knight, and Merlin the Wizard. Nowadays, many historians consider his work almost pure fantasy, although some of them still believe in the existence of a real Arthur, or at the very least, consider it a possibility that he hasn't quite been debunked yet. Either way, the legend of King Arthur still going strong. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.